Hey everyone, in today's lecture we'll be discussing chapter 16 of Fundamentals of Nursing, Nursing Assessment. And in this video you'll learn how to conduct a full nursing assessment, so let's jump right into it. Okay ladies and gents, assessment is a part of the nursing process. The nursing process is a five-step critical thinking guide and a form of scientific reasoning. It's often referred to as the blueprint for patient care. And as a nurse, you'll learn to use this method to apply the best evidence available to caregiving, promoting human functions, and responses to health and illness. Whenever you apply this nursing process, it's important to have a patient-centered approach. Having this approach will lead you into having way more successful patient assessments. And just a reminder, the quality and safety education for nurses defines patient-centered care as recognizing patients as the source of control and full partner in providing compassionate and coordinated care based on respecting a person's needs, preferences, and values. Every time you meet a patient, you should be applying the nursing process. The first step of the nursing process is assessment. Assessments are the first important step in learning about your patients and gathering information about their health status. Assessments must be complete, relevant to a patient's condition, and accurate. So from that information, you'll be able to properly diagnose your patient and create the best care plan for them. Two, diagnose involves making clinical judgments about a person's health based on data you collected in the previous step, the assessment. Planning requires you to design nursing interventions to improve the goals and outcomes of healthcare delivery. The next step, implementation. Implementation involves executing the interventions prepared in your planning stage. After implementation, you will then evaluate your patient. Uh, pretty much just observe how your patient responded to your implementation and see how your patient's health has improved after carrying out your implementation step. Uh, assessment is deliberately collecting information about your patient to determine their current health status, their past health status, and their functional status. When assessing a patient, you should also learn about his or her past and present coping patterns. And when we say coping patterns, we mean how your patient responds to the changes in their health and changes in their overall life. Now, there are two stages to the nursing assessment. One is collecting information from a primary source. In most cases, your patient will always be your primary source of information. You can collect data from secondary sources, such as the patient's family members or friends, other healthcare professionals, the patient's primary healthcare provider, or their medical records if they're available. A lot of times you can gather information about your patient just by observing them. The second stage, analyzing the data. After gathering data about your patient, you'll then interpret and validate that data to ensure you have a complete set of information. Gathering information about your patients who make accurate clinical judgments about their health won't be hard at all if you remain aware of the nurse to patient relationship. This information about your patient can be gathered through different sources. Your patient is always going to be your best source of information. You can collect your patient's data by interviewing him or her through physically examining them. And remember I said you can learn a lot about your patient just through observing them with your naked eye. You can obtain information about your patient by consulting their family members or significant other. Your coworkers are another good source of data. Medical records such as patient history, lab work, x-ray results, and multidisciplinary consultation or scientific and medical literature. You can always read up on conditions you don't understand or refer back to your old textbooks. So yeah, you guys will eventually see the importance of building the nurse to patient relationship and how vital it is to data collection. Just try to spend quality time with your patient, even if it's only a few minutes, because having this therapeutic relationship keeps your patient hopeful and it allows you to get to know your patient as a person, not just their health condition. Connecting with your patient can be done when they're first admitted into your unit, when they ring their call light, or during rounds. Rounds are set intervals at which you visit your patient, check up on them, communicate with them, and rounding is going to be useful in helping you to organize the workload on your unit. During assessments, think critically about what to assess for that specific patient. Determine what questions are appropriate based on your clinical experience and your patient's health condition or status. And this is something you'll learn how to do as you gain experience throughout your career as a nurse. Now, there are assessment types. One type of assessment is the patient-centered interview, which is usually conducted during a nursing health history. You collect information about your patient by asking them questions about their symptoms and overall health status. 
There's the physical examination assessment where you collect information about your patient by evaluating them. And then there are periodic assessments in which you'll assess periodically. You make these assessments during rounding or while administering care. For example, say you're changing a patient's dressing, you'll also be physically examining their wound and observing other areas of their body to gather more data about them. Okay, so let's discuss cues and inferences. A cue is information you obtain through senses. When assessing your patient, what do you see, feel, smell, or hear? Do you see yellowing of the sclera? Do you feel tenderness during palpation? Do you smell any unpleasant odors? Do you hear wheezing when your patient breathes? Things like that. And an inference is going to be how you interpret those cues. Now, whenever you're conducting a comprehensive patient history, there are two approaches you can use. You could use the database approach. A database is a structured format based on an accepted practice standard. And an example of a database would be Gordon's 11 functional health patterns. And we're actually going to take a look at an example of 11 functional health patterns. It's not Gordon's model. It's more of a typology, but it still does carry out the same purpose as Gordon's model. You could also conduct a problem-oriented assessment. A problem-oriented assessment focuses more so on the patient's presenting problems. This requires you to ask the patient follow-up questions to understand the nature of his or her problems. And you're also going to focus on these problem areas during the physical examination. So we're going to briefly look at an example of both approaches just so you guys can be familiar with them. So here's an example of 11 functional health patterns you could use as a guide to assess your patient. Again, this isn't Gordon's model, but it is similar. Let's go over them starting with number one, health perception, health management pattern. This pattern describes a patient's self-report of their health and well-being, how well they manage their health, and the frequency of their health care visits. Two, nutritional metabolic pattern describes a patient's daily or weekly pattern of fluid and food intake, their food preferences, food restrictions, diet, appetite, and weight. The elimination pattern describes patterns of excretory functions of the bowels, bladder, and skin. Activity exercise pattern describes patterns of physical activity, exercise, leisure, and the patient's ability to perform daily living activities. The sleep rest pattern describes sleep patterns, rest, and relaxation. The cognitive perceptual patterns describe sensory perceptual patterns such as language adequacy, memory, and a patient's decision-making abilities. Self-perception self-concept patterns describe a patient's concept of self, self-worth, emotional patterns, and body image perception. 8. Sexuality reproductive patterns describe a patient's satisfaction and dissatisfaction with their sexuality pattern, reproductive patterns, premenopausal and postmenopausal problems. Role relationship pattern describes a patient's pattern of role engagements and relationships. Coping stress tolerance pattern describes a patient's ability to manage stress, their previous coping patterns, their source of support, and the effectiveness of their coping patterns in times of stress. And lastly, 11, value belief patterns. Value belief patterns describes patterns of values, beliefs, including spiritual practices and goals that guides a patient's choices and decisions. And remember, this database can be used to assess any problem your patient may present to you. Let's also look at an example of a problem-focused approach to patient assessment. Say, for example, a patient tells you they're having pain, right? You want to conduct the assessment around the patient's pain. You want to first assess the nature of the pain. When assessing the nature of the pain, you ask your patient to describe their pain or to place their hand over the area of pain. Your job as the nurse is to observe for nonverbal cues, observe where the patient points to the pain, and to note if the pain is referred or localized. If you're assessing precipitating factors of pain, ask him or her if the pain worsens when they do certain activities or during specific times of the day or week. Then you'll observe if your patient demonstrates nonverbal signs of pain when they move, swallow, or position a certain way. And remember, nonverbal signs of pain can be anything from facial expressions of frowning, moaning or groaning, or even agitation. Now, when assessing the severity of the pain, you can ask your patient to rate their pain on a scale of 1 to 10. Then you'll physically inspect that area of discomfort and palpate for tenderness. And again, pain may not always be your problem of focus. This is just an example. There are two types of data that can be collected, subjective data and objective data. Subjective data is a patient's verbal descriptions of their health problems. Subjective data includes a patient's feelings, perceptions, and self-report of their symptoms. This type of data will often reflect physiological responses in your patient. And an example of subjective data would be a patient telling you they're feeling lightheaded when you're doing your rounds. 
Objective data, on the other hand, are observations or measurements of a patient's health status. An example of objective data can be anything from inspecting a wound or taking your patient's blood pressure or temperature. However, objective data must always be precise and must always be clear. Let's talk more about sources of data. Again, sources of data provide information about a patient's current level of wellness and functional status. Sources of data also provide the nurse with information about risk factors for any potential health problems, responses to previous treatments, cultural background, and illness and health patterns. If a patient is conscious and alert, they're actually going to be your best source of information because who knows someone better than that person themselves, right? Now, older adults may require more time for assessment versus someone younger, especially if the patient has hearing or cognitive deficits. So your job as a nurse is to always be engaged, attentive, and to show a caring presence with patients because a patient won't reveal to you too much information about their health if it comes off to them that you don't care about them. You also want to be mindful of a patient's literacy levels when assessing them. A patient with a low literacy level might have trouble processing and understanding your questions or words if he or she speaks another language. And a way you can find out a patient's literacy level is by asking them the special question. How confident are you in filling out medical forms by yourself? And this is important for you as the nurse to know because low literacy levels and poor health outcomes do go hand in hand. And here are just some ways you can approach older adults or the elderly when assessing them. One is to listen patiently when they talk, allow for pauses, and give the patient time to tell their story. Recognize normal changes associated with aging. Symptoms in older adults are usually less dramatic, vague, or nonspecific compared to the symptoms of younger adults. If the patient has a proxy, which is someone who legally represents them, you're going to want to gather history information from that individual. Also, if the patient has limited hearing or visual deficits, you could use any of the following types of nonverbal communication when conducting the patient-centered interview. One is the patient-directed eye gaze. This allows the nurse or the patient who is speaking to check whether the information is understood. It's a way you can signal the patient to let them know that you're ready to interact with them. Eye contact also shows interest in what the other person is saying. Another type of nonverbal communication is affirmative head nodding. It has an important social function. It regulates interaction, supports spoken language, and it allows room for comment. Smiling. Smiling is positive and considered a sign of good humor, warmth, and immediacy. Smiling helps when first establishing the patient-nurse relationship. And forward leaning. This shows awareness, attentiveness, immediacy, and it shows the patient that you're interested. Family members and significant others are a secondary source of information, but primary sources of information for infants, children, critically ill adults, patients who are mentally handicapped, or have cognitive impairment. And remember, as we just discussed, the patients themselves are going to be our primary source of data, but there are factors like the ones just stated, for example, that may disable a patient to speak for themselves. Family members are good in helping us to confirm patterns, such as whether or not a patient takes their medication. They could tell you when they first started noticing changes in their family member's health or how well that patient sleeps at home. And in certain cases, family members may be the only source of information. Be sure to always receive some type of written or oral permission from a patient before you consult their family members. Some patients don't want you to question their family or get them involved at all. Let's discuss some ways you can obtain patient data within your work setting. One way is through the change of shift report. This is when two nurses meet up as the shift changes. The off-going nurse gives essential information to the oncoming nurse about the patient status and their responsibilities for the patient during their shift. A handoff is an interactive process of passing patient-specific information from one caregiver to the other. This information can obtain anything such as the patient's health condition, the status of their health problems, or implemented treatment plans. And in a lot of healthcare settings, rounds can be done multidisciplinary, meaning we collaborate with the physicians, therapists, the tech, social workers, and other staff during rounds and share information with each other about how the patient's doing, how they're responding to treatment, and the future plan of care. So you can learn a lot about your patient from your colleagues and your peers.
Medical records are a source for a patient's medical history, lab and diagnostic results, current physical findings, and the primary health care provider's treatment plan. Medical records can act as a tool to check patterns and consistency of your collected data. They offer a baseline of information about a patient's response to illness and current progress. Information in a patient's record is confidential and is only accessible to those involved in the patient's care. As a nurse, you'll have policies to govern you on how a patient's health information can be shared amongst other health care providers, such as the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, also known as HIPAA. This is a law that protects a patient's privacy and their health information. Educational, military, and employment records also obtain information about a patient. And recall from the last slide that HIPAA protects access to a patient's health information. The privacy rule does, however, allow healthcare providers to share protected information, but only under appropriate measures. So if a patient receives services at a community clinic or another hospital, you will need written permission from that patient or guardian to access their records. You could even further your understanding about the nature of a patient's illness by reviewing recent nursing, medical, and pharmacological literature. Reviewing recent literature helps you to understand which treatment may be best for your patient based on their health condition, what symptoms to expect, or if there are any other diseases that may accompany their illness. Scientific literature offers evidence to instruct you on how and why to conduct assessments for particular patient conditions. Your experiences in patient care are a source of data. Clinical experience helps you to observe patient behaviors, physical signs, symptoms, and changes. These experiences will build your ability to recognize patient patterns and teach you the types of questions to ask based on a patient's condition or status. As a nurse, your expertise will develop after testing and refining questions with patients who have similar conditions and problems. As you gain clinical experience, your critical thinking skills will become stronger. A patient-centered interview is important for patient's assessment. A patient-centered interview is relationship-based and is an organized conversation that focuses on learning about the well and the sick as they seek care. The main objective of an initial history taken is to learn details about a patient's concerns. A patient-centered interview is the basis for forming trust and effective long-term therapeutic relationships with your patients. Motivational interviewing is a type of patient-centered interviewing. This type of interviewing is going to allow you to address any feelings of fear or uncertainty a patient may be having in regards to their health care. This technique is often used in counseling. It supports patients in making decisions about their health. Effective communication is going to allow you to have the best possible outcome of a patient-centered interview. So we're going to discuss some of those communication skills that you can use during the patient-centered interview, starting with courtesy. Always greet patients by their preferred name. If you don't know their preferred name, just ask. You'll then introduce yourself and explain your role. If your role is to gather an admission history or explore the patient's symptoms or health problems, then you want to articulate that to them. Acknowledge any visitors the patient may have brought with them. Learn their names as well. Always ask for the patient's permission to conduct the interview in the presence of the visitor. Assure the patient that their information will be kept confidential amongst healthcare providers. According to the United States Department of Health and Human Services, HIPAA regulations requires patients to sign an authorization before you collect personal health data. Two, comfort. If a patient is having symptoms such as pain, fatigue, or nausea, it might be difficult for you to gather an accurate and complete admission history. In a hospital setting, perform any necessary comfort measures before beginning the interview. Maintain privacy by closing the doors and curtains. Be sure that the room temperature is comfortable for the patient. You want to ensure good lighting. If the interview takes place in a home, choose a location that's quiet with no interruptions. Avoid overtime in a patient because you can always return for another visit to gather more information. Next is going to be connection. It's always important to make a good first impression. Patients know if you care. If you begin collecting a history by staring at the computer the whole time or constantly checking your cell phone, a patient will perceive you as uncaring or uninterested in their information. Always make eye contact and if you can, sit at eye level during the interview. Never dominate a discussion or assume you know the nature of a patient's problem. You can start with open-ended questions such as how have you been feeling or what questions would you like to discuss. Listen and be attentive. Use observational skills. Pay attention to a patient's tone of voice, posture, and level of energy when they're talking. 
Respect silence and be flexible. Let the patient's needs, concerns, and questions guide your follow-up questions. And lastly, confirmation. At the end of an interview, ask the patient to summarize the discussion so there are no uncertainties. Be open to further clarifications or discussion. Always ask your patient if there is anything else he or she would like to share with you. Now, if there are questions you can't answer, just let them know and promise you'll return with the follow-up as soon as possible if you can. You always want to be prepared for the interview, though you're going to collect information when you get there. Having a little bit of background information about your patient beforehand will make things a little bit easier for the both of you. All right, so just some things you want to make sure you do before an assessment interview. You want to review a patient's medical records if that information is available. The reason I say if it's available is because if you're performing this interview during patient admission, then the only information that may be available to you is the admitting diagnosis. You want to also review the note entry from the previous nurse, and then you're going to want to try to identify problems that may need clarification or a follow-up. And always remember guys, the more you're prepared for an interview, the more data you'll collect, I guarantee. As we stated earlier, an interview involves collecting a nursing health history and gathering information about a patient's condition. It's also a way for you to collect objective and subjective data. Now, later interviews may have a different focus than the initial interview. In a later interview, you assess more about a patient's presenting situation and discuss specific problem areas. All patient-centered interviews have three phases, orientation and setting an agenda, the working phase, and the termination phase, so let's discuss the three. All right, starting with the orientation and agenda phase. During this phase of the interview, you want to first introduce yourself, explain your position and the purpose of the interview, whether it be a brief assessment or a nursing health history. Explain why you're collecting the data and assure your patient that all information will be kept confidential. Then you're going to want to set an agenda for how you're going to gather information about your patient's concerns and problems. You could ask the patient for a list of his or her concerns or problems. This kind of makes the patient feel more comfortable about speaking to you and it makes them more active during the interview. And always remember that the best clinical interviews are going to focus on the patient's goals, preferences, and concerns, not your own agenda. The working phase of the interview requires you to ask open-ended questions. These type of questions will allow the patient to describe their concerns clearly. For example, you could start by having your patients to describe their symptoms or physical concerns. You could also ask him or her to describe their health care expectations. You could say to your patient, tell me what you know about your health care problem. Never rush your patient when they're talking, listen attentively, and use other therapeutic communication techniques that will encourage them to tell their story. And we'll go over some of those techniques in just a few. Terminating an interview does require skill. When terminating an interview, you want to summarize your discussion with your patient. Make sure the information that you gathered is accurate. Give your patient an indication that the interview is coming to a close. For example, before asking your last question, you could say, I have just two more questions. We'll be finished in a few minutes. Or, all right, just one last thing before we go. This helps you to keep your patient attentive and gives them lead way to ask you more questions by knowing that the interview is coming to a close. Always end the interview in a friendly manner and tell the patient when you'll be back to provide care. The way an interview is conducted is just as important as the questions you ask. You're responsible for directing the flow of the discussion to get as much information from the patient as possible. Some interviews are focused, some are comprehensive. Either way, always listen carefully to the information they share because this helps you to direct a patient to provide specific details or further discuss a topic that might reveal a potential problem. Keep in mind that the information you receive from your patient is subjective, so be sure to always go back and validate the patient's report with objective data. For example, if your patient tells you they're having trouble breathing, then you're going to want to assess their respiratory rate and lung sounds during the physical examination. Now let's discuss some interview techniques that will help you to conduct a successful interview starting with observation. Always observe a patient's nonverbal communication such as eye contact, their tone of voice, body language, appearance, and how they interact with their surroundings. 
Determine if the data you obtained is consistent with what the patient says. By establishing a trusting nurse-to-patient relationship, you'll make the patient feel comfortable asking you questions about the healthcare environment, plan treatment, diagnostic testing, and available resources. Because remember, the patient also obtains information from you during the interview as well. A patient needs this information from you to make decisions about their health and plan their goals of care. Asking open-ended questions is another technique that can lead to a successful interview. They prompt the patient to describe a situation in more than one or two words, and it encourages him or her to tell their story. Open-ended questions also strengthen your relationship with your patient because they show that you care to hear their thoughts or feelings. An open-ended question should not lead to specific answers. These questions are used to help you find out the patient's health goals, concerns, and problems. An example of an open-ended question is, can you tell me how you're feeling? Leading questions are the most risky. The reason why is because they have a possibility of narrowing down the information to what a patient thinks you want to know. An example of a leading question is, it seems to me that this is bothering you. Is that true? Another technique that encourages the patient to give more detail, back channeling. Back channeling reinforces interest in what your patient is saying. This technique includes making good eye contact and using active listening prompts. So as your patient is talking, you can be using active listening prompts such as, all right, go on, or my favorite, "Uh uh-huh. These listening prompts let your patient know that you have interest in what they are saying. All right, probing. Probing is a technique that encourages your patient to give you full descriptions without trying to control the direction of their story. Probing includes other open-ended questions such as, what else is bothering you or is there anything else you can tell me? Probe until the patient has no more details to give to you. Remain observant. If you see that your patient is starting to get tired or uncomfortable, know that it is time to postpone the interview. Direct closed-ended questions require short answers because unlike open-ended questions, these questions won't encourage the patient to give more information than you ask for. Direct closed-ended questions I notice act more so as a problem-seeking technique to find out specific information. These questions are usually very detailed to accurately identify a patient's problem, and they're usually based on information provided in a patient's story, and then they're asked to identify more specific problem areas. This technique allows you to get specific information about your patient's health problems, such as their symptoms, relief measures, or precipitating factors. An example of a direct closed-ended question is, do you have pain or cramping? This will result in your patient giving you a yes or no answer. Or you may ask, how often does the dizziness occur? He or she may reply twice a day or three times a week. So you see these questions are going to lead you to short specific answers. And direct closed-ended questions also will allow you to validate or clarify something your patient said that you may be unclear about. A nursing health history is a key component of a comprehensive assessment and it's either gathered during an initial interview or during early contact with the patient. Time and the patient's priorities determine how complete a history will be. A comprehensive history covers all health dimensions. And this is going to be good because it's going to allow you to develop a complete plan of care for your patient. Okay, so let's discuss cultural considerations during a nursing health history. To conduct an accurate and complete assessment, you need to be considerate of a patient's cultural background. To do this, you should never assume that you know a patient's cultural beliefs without validation from him or her first. When cultural differences exist between you and a patient, respect the unfamiliar and be sensitive to the patient's unique needs. If you're unsure about what a patient is saying, ask for clarification to prevent making the wrong diagnostic conclusion. Always be respectful to the patient and their cultural differences. Never impose your own attitudes, biases, or beliefs. Avoid making stereotypes or assumptions tied to stereotypes because this can lead you to collect inaccurate information. An example of this would be thinking that an obese patient doesn't exercise. On the right here is an example of a nursing health history form. However, never let a history form shape your entire assessment. As the nurse, you decide what information to collect based on your patient's needs and their responses to your questions. Some information that you'll collect during a nursing health history is a patient's biographical information, their chief concern or reason for seeking health care, the patient's expectations, their current illness or health concerns, health history, family history, psychosocial history, their spiritual health, and a review of systems. So discussing the components of the nursing health history, starting with biographical information. 
Biographical information is usually collected by the admitting office, but if that isn't the case, this component of the nursing health history requires you to collect data about the patient's factual demographic. This includes their age, address, occupation, working status, marital status, source of health care, and the type of insurance they have. Your patient's chief complaint is usually already typed on the admission sheet. The chief complaint is a concise statement that describes the patient's symptoms, problems, condition, diagnosis, the physician's recommended return, and other reasons for seeking health care. You want to still ask the patient why he or she is seeking health care and record their response in quotation marks. Then compare what he or she said to the chief concern on the admission sheet. Another component of the nursing health history, patient expectations. Patient satisfaction is a standard measure of quality for all hospitals across the country, and if patients' needs aren't met, the quality of a hospital can be considered poor. Patients have expectations of receiving information about their treatments and a plan of care for returning home. They expect the relief of their symptoms and expect to be shown compassion by healthcare providers. Now, a patient usually expresses their expectations during the initial interview when they first enter the healthcare setting, but your job as the nurse is to later assess whether your patient's needs have been met or if they've changed. Present illness or health concerns. If a patient presents an illness, collect essential and relevant data about their symptoms and how those symptoms affect the patient's health. You could also apply the acronym PQRST to guide you through this part of the nursing health history. Let's go over the acronym starting with the letter P, provoke. Ask the patient questions to determine what provokes their symptoms, what makes it better or worse, do certain activities affect it? During Q, you determine the quality of the symptom. What does the symptom feel like? If the patient can't describe what it feels like, offer probes such as, is it sharp, dull, or burning sensation? Then there's radiate. Here you determine if the patient's symptom is radiated or localized. You could ask him or her questions such as, where is the symptom located? Is it in one place? Or does it go anywhere else? Then there is S for severity. Ask your patient to rate the severity of their symptom on a scale of 1 to 10. This gives you a baseline to compare to in the follow-up assessment. In time, assess the onset and duration of the symptom. You could ask the patient questions such as, when did the symptom start? Does it come and go? If so, how often or for how long? What time of the day or what day of the week? Also assess if the patient has concomitant symptoms. Does he or she experience other symptoms along with their primary symptom? For example, does the nausea accompany pain? Now, as we briefly stated earlier, guys, to successfully explore a patient's illness or healthcare problem, you're gonna wanna use a patient-centered approach. This requires you to collect a patient's values, preferences, and express needs as a part of your clinical review. Make sure that the interview is inclusive. Some ways to implicate a patient-centered approach during a nursing health history is to one, try to understand the illness through the patient's eyes. You could do this by asking them, what do you think is wrong with you? Or what worries you the most about your illness? When discussing treatments, value a patient's experience with their own health and symptoms. Ask them the questions, what should we do to eliminate your problem? What type of treatments do you use? Or what benefit do you expect from the treatment? Now, if there is a cross-cultural difference between you and your patient, you're going to want to ask yourself these three questions. What is unique about my patient's culture and how does it impact the treatment plan? What type of treatments or healthcare practices should I use? Is there potential to have a cultural misunderstanding? If so, try to correct it immediately. And as you guys can see, these implications are similar to the things we've discussed already. So as long as you're following the proper protocols when collecting data, you will still be establishing and building that nurse-patient relationship as well. Now, when collecting history about a patient's health, you want to, of course, assess if the patient has ever been hospitalized, injured, or has ever had surgery. You want to include a complete history of a patient's medication. This includes herbal and over-the-counter drugs. If a patient has an allergy, you're going to want to note the specific reaction and treatment on the assessment form. This includes allergic reactions to food, latex, drugs, or contact agents such as soap. Ask the patient if they've had previous problems with medications or food to help clarify the type of agent, the amount of agent, and how they react to the agent. Include a patient's habits and lifestyle patterns. You want to assess the use of alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, or recreational drugs. This is going to help you to determine if the patient is at risk for any liver, lung, heart, or nervous system diseases. 
Assessing a patient's sleep patterns, exercise, and nutritional habits also play a big role when planning nursing care. Your goal as a nurse is to match a patient's lifestyle patterns with approaches in the care plan as much as possible. The family component of a nursing health history involves collecting information about a patient's immediate and blood relatives. This is going to help you to determine whether or not he or she is at risk for illnesses due to a genetic gene. This component of the nursing health history should reveal information about the patient's family structure, their relationship with their family, how the family functions, and if their family is supportive. This is really important in planning care because if a patient's family isn't supportive, it's better to not involve them in the patient's care at all. The psychosocial component of a nursing health history provides information about a patient's support system. Their support system could be anyone from their spouse or partner, their children, other relatives, or close friends. Now, during this part of the nursing health history, you want to assess how a patient and their family members cope with stress. Here, you should learn if a patient has experienced any recent losses that may cause them to grieve. If a patient has coping behaviors such as walking, talking with a friend, or reading, feel free to include those in your nursing interventions. When assessing information about a patient's spiritual health, you want to keep in mind that a person's life experiences can often shape their spirituality. Spirituality is the totality of one's being. And might I add, collecting information about a person's spiritual health isn't always going to be easy. So try to patiently review with them their life, their source of guidance, beliefs, and the relationship they have with their family when it comes down to exercising their faith. Also assess religious practices that him or her may use to express their spirituality. This could be anything from prayer, meditation, ceremonies, or rituals. You know, it could be anything, but just keep in mind that a patient might request the availability of these practices while they're in the healthcare setting. The review of systems, or the ROS, is a systematic method used to collect subjective information from your patient to determine if they have any health issues in any of their bodily systems. Now, during this component of a nursing health history, you pretty much just want to explore each organ system in depth. Ask him or her about normal functions of each body system and any noted changes. Now, if you're using an admission form, you may not be able to cover all of the questions about each body system every time you perform a history. And remember that these changes are subjective because they're described by how the patient perceives them. So after reviewing the systems, you should be performing a physical examination to further explore and confirm the information that your patient has given to you. The physical examination involves the use of the techniques inspection, palpation, auscultation, and percussion. And you guys will learn more about the patient examination techniques when you make it to chapter 31. You want to always make sure you're closely observing a patient's verbal and nonverbal behaviors. Observations direct you to gather additional objective information to form an accurate conclusion about your patient's condition. Say, for example, a patient tells you that they have no concerns about their health, but you notice shakiness and restlessness. This could indicate that he or she is having anxiety. An important aspect of observation includes a patient's physical, developmental, psychological, and social levels of function. Observation of function usually takes place in that person's home, but it can take place in a healthcare setting as well. Diagnostic and lab results give us a further explanation of problems we find during the nursing health history and the physical examination. And as we briefly discussed earlier, diagnostic and lab tests are going to be helpful in verifying the information our patient gives us about their health. Because remember that subjective data, which is data you collect from your patient, always has to be verified with objective data. A patient's lab results are always going to be compared to the norms for their age group and gender. These results are actually going to lead you into the second step of the nursing process, which is the diagnosis. Yep, these results are going to help you to accurately diagnose your patients. Actually, let's discuss an example. Say during the nursing health history, your patient reports having a bad cold for the past few days and at present has a productive cough with brown phlegm and a little bit of shortness of breath. When you physically examine them, you notice he or she has an elevated temperature, increased respiration, and decreased breath sounds. You review the results of a complete blood count, and you notice that the patient's white blood cell count is elevated. And I'm sure you guys remember from anatomy and physiology that an elevated white blood cell count indicates an infection. 
Then, after reporting your data to the patient's health care provider, they request a chest x-ray film. After observing the x-ray, the patient's health care provider medically diagnoses the patient with pneumonia. However, your assessment should lead you as the nurse to diagnose the patient with impaired gas exchange. Interpreting and validating data you received from an assessment requires critical thinking because think about it, you have to continuously interpret information and then make sure it's validated and validated successfully to make sure you collected a complete set of information during the assessment. But if you've interpreted and validated all data, then you can go ahead and move forward in the nursing process and make your clinical decision about your patient's care. When interpreting assessment data, you're going to want to use clinical reasoning. To do this, you have to determine if there are any abnormal findings within the data you collected. And remember that you may need further observations to clarify your data, and then you'll be able to properly identify what your patient's health problem is. Patterns of data reveal meaningful clusters. A data cluster is a set of signs and symptoms that you logically group together. I have a chart here on the right with some examples of trends in data clusters. Um, feel free to pause the video to take a look, but I'll go over some with you. Say for instance, your patient is uncomfortable. This is going to cause him or her to want to stay in bed. And because they're uncomfortable, this is going to limit their moving and most likely cause them to frown whenever he or she tries to move. Another pattern, if a patient is anxious, they're less likely to make eye contact and more likely to be restless and ask you lots of questions. So you see, when you interpret data, you'll also see that that data may trigger a trend or pattern. Validating data involves clarifying vague data or data that you are unclear about. Before interpreting data, you always want to validate that information you collected to avoid making an incorrect inference. Validation of assessment data involves comparing the data with another source to determine its accuracy. And just some sources of validation, you could look up a patient's medical records, you could consult other nurses or healthcare team members, or a patient's family or friends can often validate your assessment information. Critically think during patient assessments to fully understand and grasp their problems, carefully judge the extent of their problems, and discover possible relationships between problems. Ask the patient to validate any unclear information you collected during an interview or nursing health history. Okay, so very important topic. Whenever you are documenting information, you want to make sure you use clear, concise, and appropriate terminology. And this is because this information that you are documenting is going to be the baseline to identify a patient's health problems and their care plan. A lot of documentation today is done electronically, but in the nursing profession, documentation, whether it be written or done electronically, is very important. It's a legal and professional responsibility for the nurse to observe and record a patient's status. The Nurse Practice Acts in every state and the ANA's nursing social policy statement requires accurate data collection as an essential function of a nurse's role. If you perform an assessment and don't document anything, it won't be available to anyone else caring for the patient. When recording patient data, it's important to be as descriptive as possible. You have to report anything you hear, see, smell, or feel. Make sure you use accurate terminology. For example, if you're documenting a patient's weight, make sure you add the correct unit. Any subjective information, and remember subjective information is information you receive directly from your patient, make sure you use quotation marks when documenting their statement. Okay, concept mapping. Let's talk concept mapping and then I'll let you guys go. There are going to be patients you care for that will have more than one health problem. Concept mapping gives you a visual representation of how those health problems connect with one another. Organizing assessment data is going to be the first step to concept mapping. The next step is to identify specific nursing diagnoses to appropriately plan your nursing interventions. Concept mapping offers reflection and helps students to evaluate critical thinking patterns and discover reasons for provided nursing care. Concept mapping allows you to reach a perspective of your patient's healthcare needs, which will lead you to making better clinical decisions. All right, ladies and gents, that's the end of our lecture on the nursing assessment. Remember to never give up and have an amazing semester.